Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm the host of the show, Lori LeBay, and my mom had dementia for 30 years. So I've been there, done that, and get what you're going through. And our show is all about raising people's voices all around the world. For those who are living with a diagnosis, to families caring for them, to professionals, researchers, movie directors, songwriters, authors, and so much more. We want to give you hope and strategies to live fully and to be able to still find the joy when Alzheimer's or another form of dementia, you know, knocks on your door. Um, here, here at Alzheimer's Speaks, I consider us true talk radio. We typically fill an hour of honest, authentic conversation. We're not about sound bites. We're about giving you sound information. Now, today, um, before I introduce our guest, and I'm so honored to have uh, Dr. Mann with us, we are. I'm, I'm just going to do a couple of shout outs to a few organizations. One is uh, Jennifer Fitzpatrick, who has written the book, Cruising Through Caregiving. And she is um, doing some webinars still through the end of August. And you can find more information by going to our homepage at Alzheimer's Speaks. You'll see a graphic. Just go ahead and click on that. I also want to give a shout out to Stall Catchers. Stall Catchers is a game where you can actually play a game and analyze real life data for Alzheimer's research. And again, just go to alzheimerspeaks.com and you will find um, the graphic there that you can just click on and move forward with. Uh, last, I want to uh, give a shout out to is Memory, the Memory Cafe directory. Um, David does such a great job with this. Um, we are I think pushing over 700 memory cafes now in just really a short period of time. And he has organized them all. So you can find one for yourself and the one you're caring for with dementia. These groups are meant for you to go together. Again, just go to memorycafedirectory.com. And don't forget to check out all the resources we have at alzheimerspeaks.com. Um, if you want to build a dementia-friendly community, if you're looking for a keynote speaker, I would love to talk with you. I'd also love to talk with you to see if maybe you're interested in being a guest on our show because everybody has a story. So if you go to our main website, there's a big contact us at the top. Again, go to alzheimerspeaks.com, click on that, and give me a shout out, and we will have a conversation about your story and get you on the schedule. All voices are welcomed. We don't have to agree. We just have to agree to disagree in a polite, respectable fashion because everybody's needs are different. Every person with dementia is different. Every care partner, every family Um economic state, cultural background and needs. So we just want to make sure that we can help you in whatever fashion we can. Now, today we're going to have a great conversation with Dr. Molly Mann, and she is an adult and child psychiatrist and psychoanalyst along with an author. She is on the faculty at the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science for Stanford School of Medicine. And her latest book is marvelous. It's called Whisper, Forget Me Not. And it's filled with poetry and paintings portraying her experiences that she has had while she's watched her husband struggle with dementia. So welcome, Dr. Mann. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you, Lori, uh, for Nice introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm thrilled to have you on the show um, for for many reasons. One, I, I love your book. I think it's a very powerful, and I think it'll be very helpful for our listeners. Um, but I also appreciate your your background in you know psychology and this whole experience of how do we process our emotions and our feelings of major change going on in our life. So I think we're going to have a really 
interesting conversation. But before we dive too deep into that, can you just give our listeners a little background regarding your husband? Tell us his name, when you started seeing symptoms, and and kind of where it's gone from there. Okay. Um, yes, the Alzheimer it just creeps on us because it was like 2015. One day, my husband's name is William Stover. He's a professor of the international relation and uh, political science at the Santa Clara University here in the Northern California, the Bay Area. And um, so he's been teaching for many years. He's been uh, receiving a lot of awards for being the best teacher. Uh, one evening in January of 2015, he came home and he said, Mary, I don't know what's happening to me. I tell the class my first point and second, and I just can't remember. And this is a class that I've taught for many years, over 30 years. And I said, well, maybe you were tired or something was going on that particular day. Then again, he came back the same week on Wednesday, and again on Friday of that week, told me the same exact thing, that I cannot speak. I can't say what I want to say. So that's how uh, it manifested itself. And before that, there was another episode that uh, we were sitting at the dinner table with my colleague and his wife. Um, that was about six months prior that he was, we were talking and, you know, kind of chatting. And he talked to my friend's wife as if he was talking about me as a third person, yet I was sitting there next to him. And then my friend said, that, what's going on? Why Bill um, acts like you're not there? It just, I never imagined that this is a beginning sign of <clears throat> uh, brain illness. And again, in a retrospect, I put all of that together. I can, it makes sense what was happening. Uh, so that's, that's one item uh, of interest. And of course, I was very devastated when I heard the news from the neuropsychologist who um, made an appointment. And she said that you must be present. And I knew something was wrong. Um, that was, yeah, that was hard. February, it was the month of February, first week. We went there, I remember the day, and, and that's, you know, when we heard that he does have beginning Alzheimer, maybe a mild degree of Alzheimer. Um, yeah. Wow. So you, I, so you were able to was, get him. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you were able to get him in okay. fairly quickly for a diagnosis then from January to February in the same year, uh, yes. in 2015? Wonderful. Yes. In December of 2014, uh, his neurologist said, why don't we just do a, a, you know, a general exam? So at that time, he said, well, well he might have a, a mild cognitive impairment. So with that, I could have, you know, I, I was sort of okay. But when he turned and converted to Alzheimer, that was January. That was rather quick conversion. Um, that's what happened. Yeah. And <clears throat> yeah. Okay. All the testing and I. Uh, yeah. Okay. And and do you mind sharing your husband's name with us? Is that comfortable for you? His name. Mhm. Okay, Lori. Yeah. His first name is William. Middle name is James. Last name is Stover, S T O V E R. Yeah, okay, I go by different last name. Yeah, just mm -hmm. professionally unknown. <clears throat> okay, I just thought if we're referring to him, I'd like to refer to him by, by name, that's all, out of respect. So um, thank you for sharing that. I think it just gives our audience a, a little better idea of of where you're situated, what you're, where you're coming from. Can you tell um, our audience how Alzheimer's disease and other kinds of dementia actually impact and cause stress on family members and communities, and especially the, the care partners or spouses that are involved? Yes, this is a major impact on the caregiver. 
and the family member they don't know what they're up against just um, then you gradually in my case I was you know single-handed I had to take care of my career and, and you know it's been quite a rough road and it's a rough journey I must say but um, it does have it's like a it's a cycle um, the inner cycle which is a more intimate relationship with the you know, a spouse and sometimes with the mother daughter or father son or you, I'm sure you know that women are diagnosed a lot more one uh, out of three are men and two out of three are women with diagnosis of Alzheimer but the caregiver um, it's basically their family member initially, and then gradually they get some help, outside help. Um, nevertheless, even though there is a outside help, still the f- responsibility is really falls on your shoulder. In my case, I was the one who had to make sure to manage his day-to-day, week-to-week kind of, um, you know, uh, calendar, figuring out who was coming um to be his companion. At the beginning, it was basically hiring people to to stay with him and go on a walk and do exercise and things like that. But then, as it gets worse, and it, it the job of the um, hired care it it increases, and the same thing for the family member, myself as a spouse. So it's. Um, it was five years, gradual, gradual, little by little. It's you know he lost his function, um, and it's something we take it for granted. Okay, like brushing your teeth and or putting food in your mouth, um, you name it, or toileting things like that. Um, so yeah, it's been a uh, you know tough road, but it again depends who is in the picture. You they will be impacted. In fact, the grief of the uh, process that starts happening out of the loss of the loved one, um, it is an ongoing grief. It doesn't stop uh, while the person is alive. You just, um, uh, you're witnessing what happens and that's very difficult and very stressful. So it's not surprising to see all the illnesses that could come along. Uh, you know, people yeah. get sick. Uh, yeah. Oh, I, I totally agree. That ambiguous loss, that ongoing of never knowing what's going to happen next and, and what's going to be lost. And then sometimes it pops back up and it's functioning again and then it's gone. And mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's just, it's almost like uh, the cup game, you know, with the acorn under the cup. You just don't know where it is or, yeah. or because there really isn't a, a, a you know, a, a straight line pattern, you know, there's that saying everybody with dementia is different, but then also every care partner's different, every environment's different, every family's different. And so you add all those dynamics Absolutely. together yeah. and it, it's just, it's like scrambled eggs and um, you, you just don't know um, how, how things are going to turn out. Now, did you have, uh, do you have children that were, were able to support and, and help mm-hmm. you with that? I know some families, have children that step up and others have children, but they don't step up or they do step up and complicate things. <laughs> what was your situation? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I've been in a support group. I heard the stories about how children start sometimes fighting with each other or have a whole different opinion. In my case, we have only one daughter and she lives in Illinois, Chicago, Illinois. And so she's married, had two little kids. And she's also a physician, so she's got her hands full. And um, she's very caring daughter. Of course, long distance makes it difficult. You know, she does try to come and give me my moral support, and we talk on the phone, you know, that kind of thing. So she does understand me, what I'm going through. But, you know, there are different composition. You know, family structure could be quite different for everyone, as you just said. Every case is very, very different. Um, so there's no two cases of Alzheimer's is the same. Um, yeah, my, as far as the support system um, goes, is yes, my daughter uh, 
and then I have friends that they give me support. And I have one sister who lives about an hour away from me, and she has a very highly responsible job, and I don't expect that she would drop everything. But, you know, she's right in the background and helps and talks to me, and it's good. Yeah, I can't complain. <laughs> Yeah, it's an, it's important to be connected and but sometimes I know families have a hard time um explaining their journey and what's really happening especially in the earlier stages cuz people say, "Well, they look perfectly fine. They sound perfectly fine." There you know because when mm-hmm. you're getting together many times with friends, you're reminiscing about the past and they're not seeing right. the the inability to maybe track or you know the executive functioning items and and uh, or even just the grooming, how you're. I, I know I hid that with my with my own mother and my dad had um, brain cancer. I'd go over there and I'd mm. fix them all up and make sure they were all you know great to walk out the door, so they looked all pulled together. But they couldn't have done it on their own. Um, I'll exactly. give you an example. My my dad, for example, uh, didn't have dementia, but at the end with his brain cancer was a little more confused, and a friend of theirs passed away. And so another friend Mm -hmm. said, we'll come over and pick you up. And so they picked my dad up and my mom. And here's my dad in a suit. And all he has is an undershirt on. He doesn't have a shirt. And they took him Mm -hmm. out like that because they didn't know how to approach it. And so my dad is always, you know, kind of a jokester. And so I guess at the the wake, somebody said, hey, Dean, you, you you know, trying to trend a new style, and my dad just kind of joked along with it and, and you know, didn't mm-hmm. realize it either. But I just thought, oh, my goodness, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and I think that was a, a startling moment when people said, oh, things are changing. You know, the brain's not quite working the way it is. And, mm-hmm. and I think so often people have to almost be slapped by that crisis or mm-hmm. severely conflicted um situation that wouldn't normally happen with that person before they're willing to believe that something is wrong because nobody wants to believe how can how can people focus on the remaining skills of the person living with dementia so often we we focus on what's lost how did you make that shift yourself or how do you recommend people you know look for the positives of of what remains and, and what is still with you yeah, well, that goes back to what, you know, your own attitude, your approach to the illness. And so if you want to focus on the positives, then that would help the, the, the patient, no doubt. But in, in, in a way, one would have to um, um, do a lot of different modification of their environment where they live, you know, and making it simple and um, and then there is a the communication that we can't expect the full communication they're used to have. So whatever they can communicate with words, one would have to kind of live by. I mean, basically accept that and make sense of it. You know, and it's not just words to communicate the bodily language. Even now, my husband is a very advanced stage of dementia. He does communicate facial communication. It's it's just very fascinating you know when i see with his eyes or he rolls he follows and he shows joy if he's in pain he he has grimace so i mean we have to rely on the other things besides words so that that's one thing we we learn as a caregiver particularly when you're living with someone you know you we are the best people who know the person right and Mm -hmm. so that way we will make um, uh, changes as we go along, uh, you know. And, and one peculiar thing about Alzheimer's is, like, you know, there are some stages. It, it's not linear, you know. Some of the deficit happens, you know, um, early on, but then there's something from a stage three or four pops in in stage one, or vice versa, the stage one, and make it look like, oh, they must be just fine. They look okay. They carry a conversation, but they don't know um, the full picture. You see, that, that creates a confusion for people who mm-hmm. don't know. They haven't had experience of being around a person with dementia. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the answer to your question is that one would have to um, know that the communication remains possible, that uh, 
we don't want to highlight the word that they fail to communicate. We want to use the word that they use and then kind of trying to um, uh, press uh, reinforce that and not too much focusing on the losses but the one that remained and that one could make do with that so to speak and the remaining skills uh, also let's just say walking and he wasn't able to walk but i tried to get it you know um the walker and um, i would try to hold his hand and earlier on we would go for a short walk so i until until March of this year, I would take him with me to the gym, and I would just be his coach, you know, because he couldn't remember whether he has what he had to do, how to turn the machine on, or you know, the cardiovascular thing. So I was doing this coaching. So that's, you know, that takes a lot of motivation, and you have to really be positive about it. And you know, they need physical exercise. We all know that how. Exercise helps the circulation in the brain, and it postpones the, to some extent, you know. The, so that's one thing that his neurologists that emphasize, and I know as a physician that how important it is. He early on said that, Mali, make him go to the gym, go with him, exercise if you can every day. And so I couldn't go ex- every day, but because of my workload, but I would go maybe three to four times a week which wasn't too bad. And so I, I've done that. I think that I would uh, encourage the audience who are having a loved one with dementia of any kind, you know, it's like exercise, physical activity is very important, it's stimulating the brain, brain uh, with different games and um, uh, helping, helping, helping them how to make, make sense of things because you know, they, they are living in a confused state of mind, and you don't want to barrage them with too much stimulation. On the other hand, too little of it is not good either. So one would have to really go step by step and figure out what, um, how they're taking it, whether they're enjoying it or not. And if it's too yeah. much and tiresome, you have to stop it. Yeah. Yeah, I, th- I think that's very important to, for us to read their nonverbals and listen to their verbals. Um, when they're able to communicate with us um, in that fashion. I remember with my mom, as she progressed, she loved music and she loved to dance. And we used to stand up and dance. And then as she progressed, it Mm. was with the walker and then it was with the wheelchair. And then we just kind of arm dance, sitting down. And then we got down to just pinky dancing with our finger. Um, But she still had this beautiful smile and this joy because it was this intimate connection that we still had, you know, it was still bodies touching and moving together and feeling that just that inner sense of having somebody else be there for you. And, and, and I felt that from her as well. It was not one sided. I think a lot of people think caregiving is all giving it away, but you, you will receive from them when you start looking for for the right Mm -hmm. things. Um, One of the things I want to talk about is how does one still communicate with a loved one who has a uh, degenerative brain illness? And before I have you answer that, I just wanted to read one of your poems here that I think is, is just powerful, and it's called Moving Mouth. Moving Mouth, moving more and more with no sound coming out. Moving Mouth again and again. At last, a word. Malas. I know you tried to say my name. A second time, you called me again our cat's name. My beloved, Mm. I am not your cat. I am your wife, Molly, not Malas. Both of our eyes tear tear up. I just think that that's so powerful because they're trying so hard to connect, and sometimes the words just don't come out. The way mm-hmm. we, the mm-hmm. way we want them to. So, how did you, you know, as as the disease progressed, how did you learn to to communicate with your husband? Well, um, you know, I, you, we all need to kind of uh, come up with some kind of a examination of how the, you know, we have to do a, a bit of a guess game. How they, what they're thinking, what they must be feeling how they communicate verbally, non-verbally, 
and what they do to compensate to make us understand what they are feeling, and we have to and how they they also have reaction to the change in them. Um, so they can feel early on at least the deficits, and so that could be depressing, and you know so that's why the caregiver task. Is, is very crucial how one would stay and, and you know, positive and figuring it out to improve the understanding of all these clues that you have at your disposal and to make things work and that your positive attitude, it does affect the patient's uh, way of thinking about himself. Uh, five years of this illness, it, now it's an advanced stage um, maybe twice he had tears in his eyes, and I could feel that he was frustrated. And I don't remember exactly what we were trying to do. And I know he realized that he couldn't do it, and that that was very hard on him. Um, what I have done, I hope I'm answering your question, but in in terms of communication, so I'm I try to travel with him. So I did as best as I could, you know, every, we go international travel and uh, also naturally for his job and my job and all of that. But, you know, until last summer, we actually we did every summer, we took it, um, a trip to Europe. And last summer was to Japan. I had to present a case, a, a paper, and they, people thought, wow, they raised their eyebrow. What are you going to do now? You know, I said, well, I took him with me. I managed him in the airplane, managed him in the conference. He was a kind of a quiet type. I, I do understand there was some Alzheimer's that really belligerent and really makes life very difficult, much more difficult. But my husband is more of a quiet type. So it worked just fine. And I was happy to have him with me because for me it's a big loss because as a couple, um, we've done all those things. And, you know, taking him with me, it was satisfying for me, and it was I'm sure it was satisfying for him because I was with him. It's a familiar face, and we were doing things, fun, walking, short walk, things like that. Um, so I'm not saying that this is good for everyone, but at that time, he was able to walk. And it comes March 22nd, I come home, and the caregiver says, I can't get him up. He can't move. So that's how sudden it was, the change. So since we haven't, you know, how could we travel anywhere? That, that stopped it in December of last year. Um, so I try to keep him active and myself active because that helps me also uh, feel more optimistic, not unrealistically optimistic, but just realistically uh, taking things that are, you know, positive and not to dwell on a negative part. And losses, you know. Otherwise, there are mm-hmm. plenty of that. Yeah, I. Um, speaking of travel, I have to give a shout out. I'm work. I work with a, a dementia-friendly group here in Roseville, Minnesota, and we are working with the University of Minnesota, and we have put together a dementia. A friendly airport survey that's open till September 15th of 2019. And again, you can go to alzheimerspeaks.com. It's right on the top. Just click on it. It'll bring uh-huh. you right to it. But it, it's for people that can complete it that are in the earlier stages of the disease and their travel companions. We want feedback from both. Um, you can be anywhere in the world. Um, initially, we thought it would be Minnesota specific, and we just decided this is such a great need um, that we need to go broader. Um, also, with the travel, you know, I love that you brought your husband William with you because it, it is an important part of our lives, and it's it's something yes. that care partners and families don't want to lose um, by any stretch. And it's um, you know we need to we we need to make that more viable. In 2017, I did a a dementia-friendly cruise for people <clears throat> with dementia and their care partners. And we just had a wow. marvelous response to that. And there, um, Lisa Chinova is doing it now. I, I I don't know if I'll do another one or not. There, there are a ton of work. Um, but if anyone mm-hmm. is looking for direction in terms of where to go um, and a referral, please reach out to me. I'd be more than glad to assist you with that. 
the group that we had together actually um, got together themselves this year without any formal conference or symposium and just said, hey, we can do this on our own and we're going to. And they went as a group. So mm-hmm. it was a bunch of people from, from a memory cafe, but they were empowered to say, we can do this. Um, and we, mm-hmm. we need to come up with solutions like that for for people. Um, you know, the other thing that Absolutely. you mentioned when you were talking, when you were talking about communication and the, the progression, you know, how every, everybody is a little bit different. I think one of the things yes. that we need in this world, dementia or not, is to get people to start reading nonverbals. You had made the comment of, you know, they can pick up on your emotions, you know, when you walk in. Um, and a mm-hmm. lot of times they'll mirror, they'll mirror that back to us and we think we've covered it all up. And then we say they've, they have the problem and they were perfectly content. Until we came in with our anxiety or stress or yeah. whatever it is, and then, and then yeah. they mirror it, mirror it back. They they don't lose that ability to read our nonverbals. And in fact, most of them tell me that they have a heightened sense of awareness of reading mm-hmm. lips and watching for nonverbals because they can't always string the words together. And so I think it's teaching us that we have to slow down and be much more conscious of of all the ways we communicate because over three quarters of our communication is nonverbal, but we always seem to take a stand with a person with dementia and want those words forced to come to us and to come to us in the proper order or whatever order we think is proper um, and mm. then get disappointed mm-hmm. when, when they're not able to. So um, I, I just, I believe so much in that. And, and um, I don't know yes. if you found yes. this to be true, awesome. but mm-hmm. well, go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to add uh, what you're saying. And um Agreeing with what you say, I mean the communication part. We can't expect a, a complex thing, communication thing. So make, the rule of that uh, um, is to make it simple. Rule of simplicity: um, short sentences and also the tone of voice that you use. It, I'm sure it will convey, hopefully, compassion, love, and that's very important. And they respond. And we can use our own um, nonverbal meaning. Touching, touching is very important. Touching, they, it calms them down, and it's so important to put your hand on the, you know, the chest area where the heart is, you know, holding it quietly, and that's kind of a meditative moment. It helps both care partner and also the patient. It, it's very important to pay attention to that uh, nuances um, because they pick that up. The, you know, and the other thing is that I want to say, uh, Lori, uh, you said it earlier about the importance of music. My husband would have been a um, conductor in his other life because he, he plays piano. He, he played the piano, I should say, guitar and um, uh, a number of other things, um, wind instruments. Um, so he really cheers up when I, you know, have music played. In, he loves it because it's from past, those memory from the past, as you know, it comes back because he re- reacts to that response, and it's really very useful. Okay, I don't mean you have to be a conductor, but we all love music, you know. So music was a big part of his life. That's what I'm trying to say. And so bringing it back into the picture, it it really helps a lot. Um, oh, it's his mood. I- yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, when we think about it, I think we take music for granted, yet we hop in the car and we turn it on and it can make us laugh. It can make us cry. Um, it can make us yeah. smile. It can, you know, it, it can trigger so many different moods. And it's such a powerful tool that is used to really ignite the brain. Um, there's a, a company called um, All's Music Connect. And they mm-hmm. have um, a kind of a hidden patented um, technology within their music that you can't tell. It's just gorgeous music. But when people listen to it, um, I, I believe it's like they connect on a, a higher level for typically like, I want to say it's three or six hours. I can't remember the, the specifics mm-hmm. totally on the data, but it it is amazing. And, you know, it, when you think about it, <clears throat> Whenever we're, we're, meaning any of us, are in a more content state, 
we're going to be more connected. You know, we're go- we're yes. going to be more engaged because we're not going to have all of those arrows poking at us that we're, you know, we're scared of something or we're worried about being judged or, you know, um, being right or wrong. All of those things that, that can just frighten us and stifle us at the same time. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think people need to understand the importance of, of one being content. Harry Urban is a man who's been living with dementia about 15 years. And one of, I think the, well, he he says so many just stunning things, but I'll, I'll never forget when he said, you know, I like to relax before I got dementia. I still do. Instead of keeping me busy, because that makes you feel like you're doing something, just sit with me. And, you know, mm-hmm. smell the flowers, feel the breeze against your face, the sun shining on your body, but just ab- absorb the peacefulness. When they're peaceful, take that moment to grab it for yourself as well, instead of just mm-hmm. this busy work. And, and I know as a daughter, I followed my checklist and I was, you know, there was so much for me to do, but I, but I did learn eventually, it took me longer than I would have liked that a lot of my checklist was busy work because I just so yes. wanted to do a good job. And I, I mm-hmm. and I lost my, my personal connection. And, and then when I, when I, you know, grabbed it back and said, Hey, this is why I'm doing this to begin with is my relationship. Then mm-hmm. my relationship with my mom went to uh, multiple levels of um, unconditional love. I didn't know existed and at the end, it was it was like a spiritual relationship. I mean, we were connected yes. at such a high, beautiful level that it was, um, I can't even put it into words. And it's one I of know, those things. I know, it's indescribable. That, yeah, yeah, and you don't, you don't want anyone oh. to miss out on that, but they have to, people have to slow down to find it. You know, you don't need any words yes. when you can just end up relaxing and sitting next to somebody in silence. I, and when I go out and speak, I, you know, I talk to people about that and say how often, you know, we we revel in sitting next to somebody we love, just that peacefulness. And it, mm-hmm. it is so vitally important. I want to switch gears uh, just a little bit, um, Dr. Mann, and talk yes. about uh, with your husband's um, Alzheimer's yes. disease, how, how did that in Inspire you um, to communicate, you, you know, yourself through poetry and painting, you know, in this book, Whisper, mm-hmm. for, Forget Me Not. Mm-hmm. Yes, but I used to I mean, I write poetry, but I felt like last five years there was this uh, inner drive that I wanted to put uh, words in the uh, poetry form. Uh, rather than writing in prose. And I I think it's the byproduct of this, uh, in my opinion. And so I feel like I, it's very hard in it to to express some of the feeling that you go through as a caregiver. And at least for me, it was, you know, I think you also concurred with that, that like you were talking about how you've reached to a level of intimacy and closeness with your mom. So that itself, it's indescribable it's not possible to put forward and through poetry writing I, I get closer to that I'm not saying I'm fully successful but at least I get myself to write things that um, that's inside okay in, in a poetic way and that helps me to calm down and also f- I feel like I'm expressing it and whereas I didn't feel like I had anybody who could understand me or if they did, you know, it's, it was fine, but I also needed an additional way of expressing my inner thoughts and feelings. So that's how, um, you know, it just evolved. It wasn't like one day I said, okay, I'm going to write poems now. It just, you know, developed into that. Um, and pretty soon I said, well, I've got uh, uh, collections of poems related to this illness. And um, so I did dedicate the book. Um, to my husband and he too used to write poem in the past we would read to each other in the past so it was actually this year it was in uh, March or maybe April 
the book got published, and so I did take the book and showed it to him. His he was just so ecstatic. He showed his excitement through his body language, his face, and then what he said, I never forget. I remember that. I thought that was incredible. The word he doesn't say much, but. The book, the cover of book, because I used to talk to him, let's say, two years ago. I said, well, I'm going to write and collect these poetry. And so, yeah, that's a good idea. At that time, he was able to put some ten sentences together. But when I showed the cover of the book, he said, I remember that. He said that. It was just just amazing uh, what he managed to say that. I think it, it really brought some emotion in him. He managed to say it. A couple of words. Ironically, it's a whisper, forget me not. And he says, I remember that. So it's all about forgetting and remembering. But he managed to say, I do remember that you started this writing project. And here it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Well, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Do you mind maybe sharing with our audience a couple of your favorite poems out of the book, Whispers, Forget Me Not? Okay. Let me see. Um, I think there's one, which is silence. And Okay, silence. Breakfast in silence. Lunch in silence. Dinner in silence. Silent day silent night no words people who know you ask how you are does he talk to you I say yes you understand what I say and what you want to say people look worried about you you eat your meal with no sound and no eye contact the man who watches you found it strange not knowing what to say or how to act. Is this the question now? Should I go by myself? So this shows um, some of the uh, changes that one experiences. But, you know, yeah. And, do you, yeah. Do you, have you noticed the, the loss of, of apathy um, with your husband at all? Um, meaning not showing the feeling or apathetic. apathetic. Um, it, yes, it's more like a uh, uh, more like a mask face at times. But mm-hmm. something that really makes a difference for him somehow it kicks in from the past. His neurons in the brain is firing up. Then he responds with a smile and acknowledgement. And that's the look of familiarity, look of being understood. So that's, that comes uh, true. I don't mean all day long it's that, but there are moments like that, and I cherish mm-hmm. those moments. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's really important for people to, to understand that, um, that old process. And, and again, everybody is a little bit different, but I remember talking with Dina Dotson, who had young onset, and she said, um, you know, she was still able to communicate with people and people thought she looked normal and, uh, you know, mm-hmm. her her husband still wanted her to run the business. Her kids still wanted her to do all the momly things she's always done. And I remember her saying one time in our Dementia Chats, which is a, a video conversation I facilitate with panelists that all are diagnosed, and she says, you know, you just... I can't explain it other than to tell you that there's nothing worse for a person with dementia to look at a picture of their own children, knowing mm-hmm. that they should feel this exuberant love for them. And you have, there's just, there's nothing. She says, there's just nothing. Yes. And, yes. and she says, yes. and you feel this great guilt, you know, when you're, mm-hmm. when you're aware that this is happening. Um, for not being able to to have those feelings, but it's just the way the brain is wired at that time. And so for us sometimes to add guilt to the fire of which they are already feeling guilty and and remorseful over, 
um, you know, they don't deserve that. They deserve so much better from us because it's not yes. something that they're that they're trying to do um, in any stretch. Did you find humorous um, moments? No, so, and uh, what, mm-hmm. I just wanted to say something quick. I, I think all concepts of the guilt and embarrassment are a bit different. And they may feel something, what we don't know what's their version of feeling, uh, what they feel. I think early on or middle of stage uh, dementia, those could be detected. But later on, as you said, you know, you show the photo, this is kind of a blank look. You mm-hmm. you know they can't make out what who, who these people are in the photo. That's, that's very true. So you were going to ask about humor. Right. Oh um, yeah, yeah. And if if that, I, I know for for myself and in our family, we always used humor a lot. And that was, um, I, there were some people that would say, "Oh, you can't laugh at that situation." And it's like I would if they didn't have dementia, and they would too, you know. So we're not mm-hmm. going to give mm-hmm. we're not going to give that up in our family. But I know some people, when they're around anyone who's ill, they don't feel it's appropriate to laugh. And yet I think it's one of the most natural bonding things that we have um, that can yes. lift our spirits and change our body chemistry and the whole nine yards um, to give us Absolutely. hope. What are your thoughts about about uh, laughter and humor? Well, if then you come up with some emotional reserve, I should say, when you do all the chores and the groundwork, and, you know, hopefully you get some help to do that. But that, that there is a room for the humor. And it's good for you, for, for the caregiver, care partner. Um, when you are cheerful or you're laughing, that is contagious. And I think does affect the mood, um, the Alzheimer patient. So, you know, pretty soon, you know, it, I see a smile if I laugh about something. Up to about uh, almost a year ago, we would watch together Seinfeld and uh, Big Bang Theory. So I don't know how much he was getting it, but he did laugh. Not I was laughing a whole bunch more, of course, but his level of laughing <laughs> because <laughs> of the illness had, had diminished, but still he was laughing. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> so it was well, just, it, you know, something to share. Yeah. Well, and, and again, sometimes they will mimic whatever we're doing back. And, you know, right. laughter is a lot better than anxiety or anger, you know, or, you know, not such a good temperament. <laughs> so I think that there's, Absolutely. you know, there's a, there's uh-huh. definitely a plus with all that. I just interviewed somebody on uh, laughter yoga and they really got into, you know, how the body doesn't know the difference between real laughter and, and fake laughter, but all of the, the chemical changes that happen yes. within our body and how healthy that is. And, you know, my mom's been gone now five years, and when I go out and I speak, and I mean, I tell stories, I get people laughing, but I get them crying, too, and mm. it's just, you know, it's, it's we shouldn't give up any of our emotional states because we're dealing yes. with dementia. You know, it's not our emotions mm-hmm. that are good or bad, it's it's how we react to them, which you, you well Absolutely. know, but I think, but I think sometimes, you know, we feel embarrassed, um, or mm. uncomfortable showing certain emotions. And, I, you know, I think that's part of what's wrong with society as a whole right now that's gotten us in such a, a mess. People aren't expressing themselves, and then they're kind of exploding internally. And, and you know, it's just yeah. not healthy for us uh, from a mental health standpoint at all, I don't think. Um, so I encourage people, laugh. You know, you don't want to be laughing at somebody with dementia. You want to be laughing with somebody with dementia. Mm-hmm. But, yes. but realize the yeah. gift that that is. Um, is there another poem that you'd like to share with us, uh, Dr. Mann? Yeah, I have a couple, but I let me see. But I have one titled Remembering, Forgetting, mm-hmm. Remembering. Forgetting our childhood, remembering how to remember, not forgetting to remember. I insist how to. If I size the moment in a picture, if I said in words, if I held your hand and insist to remember the moment with you, if I write the words, it could help. I ask you today, if you know the name of the place we were together, 
know was your response. The look on your face told me the same that you can't remember yesterday. You did not know where you were. Part of her sorrow greets me at the door. So this is um, time that you discover that, you know, you, you ask a question, you, you, it's lost. So this is the moment that you can't really share. So particularly mm-hmm. for the spouse, it's very, you know, difficult time uh, to get introduced. It's how this illness is uh, so cruel. It just bit by bit, it takes over. And so it takes over and you can't really um, do much. And uh, you can't reverse it. So you've got to learn how to deal with this um, incremental loss on a daily basis. Agree, agree. One of the things, um, I, I think that was just such an important poem, but something that just came to my mind was uh, something that um, Susan Sessions said, and she's since, passed, since um, passed from dementia, but she talked mm-hmm. about memories, and, and something that I think families do so often is we will um, we'll declutter, we'll get rid of their stuff, mm-hmm. their collectibles, thinking that we're helping simplify things. But one of the things she pointed out was she said, what you have to realize when you're decluttering is that what you see as clutter or junk might be Mm -hmm. triggering a wonderful memory for me. And so when you toss that out, now you're blatantly taking my memories away and they're already slipping from us. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to be really careful when when that occurs or if someone has to make a move trying to figure out what truly is important what will give them peace what will bring them happiness and we should be having those conversations early on susan actually um, wrote notes on the back of of items saying when she bought it why she bought it and what it what it meant to her so before oh. somebody tossed it, they they would see that, which I thought was really a brilliant thing to mm-hmm. do. But she said it didn't work in mm-hmm. all cases. Sometimes they just toss too. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. With that, well, our mm-hmm. our time is just mm-hmm. about up here, and I want to make sure that mm-hmm. that um, people know how to get a hold of you. They can um, yes. email you at m a l i. M A N N D is in dog at gmail dot com. That's M A L I M A N N. Oh, I'm sorry, it's M D um, at gmail dot com. And we also all have a link case. to all, yeah. okay, all lowercase. And we also have uh-huh. a link uh, where they can go and get your book on Amazon as well. Um, mm-hmm. And so, again, the book is called Whisper, Forget Me Not. And, again, beautiful, beautiful poetry and lots of wonderful art in here. So it's a, it's a full, it's a full color um, book. And I think one that will just resonate with just about anybody, I think, who, who picks this up. Um, it's very, um, it's very important. You, you capture so many brilliant, um, moments in just a few oh, words, um, you know, with, with your poetry in terms of, you know, the experience and, and things that you have. Um, you've got one titled last visit on my mm-hmm. way to, to the airport, you rush to see me off. I knew this was the last time, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, you know, don't, you don't need a lot of words sometimes for us to be able Mm -hmm. to, to feel what, uh, what it's like. And um, again, I thank you so much for, for sharing your world with us and and your life with your husband and your experiences and your, and your professional um, information as well, you know, in terms of processing Mm -hmm our emotions. Any, any last tips um, or advice that you'd like to give? We've got about uh, two minutes left. Okay. The advice is uh, stay true with your own emotion. Uh, try not to hide it from yourself and uh, try to articulate what they might be and um, also uh, be prepared for the 
grief reaction, grief that is, uh, you know, it makes it more complicated kind of grief. But nevertheless, I think it's possible to do that when you're also getting some uh, support, um, you know, stay with the uh, caregiver support uh, weekly, and they, they have everywhere in the Bay Area, and I'm sure nationwide. So that would be helpful because you don't feel like you're alone. Uh, there are other people who are dealing with difficult this situation like that. Exactly. Well, again, Dr. Mann, thank you so much for your time and, and thank sharing you, your, world, yeah. your world with uh, with your husband, William, with us. And again, your book, Whisper, Forget Me Not. And um, uh, again, I, I just feel honored to have you on the show. Uh, for our audience, please spread the word, you know, like, click, share. I think this will be a, a helpful um uh, uh, episode for people to listen to. I think this book will be a, a great one for people to pick up to give them some peace and calm and mm-hmm. know that they're not alone with their emotional swings through the journey. And again, uh, check us out at alzheimerspeaks.com. That's alzheimerspeaks.com. Two S's in the middle. We have all kinds of free resources there and we would love to assist you any way we can. I also want to give a shout out to the Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation. Uh, they deal mm-hmm. with uh, with the disease from a holistic fashion. So exercise, diet, meditation, just go to alzheimersprevention.org. That's alzheimersprevention.org. Have a blessed week, everyone, and thank you again. Bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hey everybody, Jared Sebesti, your host of Retire Repurposed. This podcast is dedicated to help people transition into fulfilling and purposeful retirements. Retirement is a big life change. In fact, the two most dangerous years of a person's life are the year they were born and the year they retire. Few people could just flip the switch from working a career 30 or 40 plus years retiring on Friday without methodical steps to living what we call a repurposed retirement. To listen now, search Retire Repurposed on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.